Hi, today's video is going to be about Newtone IS515 selective call remote stations. All the information in this video applies also to what would be Newtone IS518, which is the larger uh, station with an 8-inch speaker cone in it. Those are inside stations. And also the IS-519s, which are patio stations. And then there are the IC-502s, which are wall remotes and so forth. But they're all fundamentally the same design, just in different form factors for different applications. This is a customer's IS-515, and this is a selective call remote station. These are used exclusively with Newtone IM-5006 and IM-5006. 5000 uh, selective call intercom systems. Since this is a selective call station, it works a lot like an office phone system. When the speakers are installed, there's little dip switches on the back on the board that are set to give the station an identification number, and then you can call rooms individually. For instance, room number four can call room number six, and they can talk back and forth, and the other stations remain silent. Or if you have a 5006 system and you have the music playing, the music stays on in the other rooms and it, it turns off in the two rooms that are using the intercom. So the number pad is to call up individual rooms. If you're calling a station that's that's number a number that's less than 10, it would be 0, 1, 0, 2, and so forth, and then 10 through whatever. Uh, 5006 systems can have up to 21 st or 24 stations. IM 5000s can have up to 20 stations. And then, so you have, you can call a station, you have a talk button. Um, 5000s and 5006s have hands through reply, so the person replying doesn't have to operate the controls. You have an end call button to end the intercom call. You can do what is an all call. An all call calls up all stations at one time. If you don't know what room the person is in, you can do an all call and broadcast out through the house. Door turns on, connects to the entry door stations, and then you can talk and hear the reply. Private button prevents calls from coming into that station, and the person trying to call that station gets these two little short beeps to let them know the station is on private. You have a monitor button, which turns the microphone on on that station permanently, so you can use it as sort of a baby monitor kind of thing. There is a busy light, so if you are using station, let's say station four call station six, and they're talking back and forth, the busy light would come on on the rest of the station to let someone know that the system is in use and they have to wait. The other thing is you have separate music volume control and separate intercom volume control. So you can actually turn the music all the way down in a room and it doesn't affect the intercom volume at all. Or I suppose the other way around, you could turn the intercom volume down and leave the music turned up. Uh, these work in steps. So each time you push it, it raises or lowers the volume in a predetermined amount. So it goes like chunk, 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 chunk down to zero and then all the way up to maximum. It's a fairly complicated uh, station and it's a lot different than other stations from other simple, simpler systems. On the back of the station, we have a lot going on. So up here we have the speaker cone. And then to we give have you a little bit of an idea boards, yeah, the this difference is the between a board like or main this board, and, and then there's a, a common one underneath I'm it. Show you the what you see here, so this is a ferrite take this core apart, that the speaker, the to wire to the speaker cone is, is wrapped here. through. That's the cut down interference that the speaker might be affected by from the circuitry here. Here we have our two two circuit boards out of the IS515. This is the main board and this is the switch board and this is the underside of the main board. It would be turned over the other way when it's mounted in the, in the station. And to give you some idea about the difference of complexity between a station like this and a common station, here's a switch board out of a Newtone IS-445, so it's the same vintage of system. This would go with an IM or an IMA-4406 system. And what you have here are a mechanical volume control, some push-button mechanical switches, a relay, a few diodes, and a couple resistors. There's not a lot on here. And if you compare it to this, you can see this is many, many, many times more complicated than something like this. 
when these kinds of stations have problems, it is quite an effort to repair them sometimes, and I'm going to show you why that is. Systems like the IM5006 and IM5000, because they're selective call systems, they incorporate a lot of interesting design that you don't see in other models. The way you can sort of think about it is it's as if every station is a master station. On most conventional intercom systems like the 4406, the 4406 master station is 90% of the system. The remote speakers are just passive remote stations. They can't really do much of anything on their own. Everything comes and goes from the master station. On a 5006 or an IM5000, the remote stations in many respects are equal to the master station if you eliminate from the master station you know if you, if you have a 5006 you have a radio you have a cassette player if you eliminate that kind of stuff and some of the other circuitry that allows the radio and the cassette player and those kind of things to operate what you end up with is in some respects something very similar to this the control unit or the master station would have a power supply that powers the remote speakers and those sort of things but from a functional intercom and audio point of view they're very similar in design so you have a lot of complexity on a fairly small circuit board that you can see is very jam-packed full of stuff part of the design of the IM5006 and 5000 is since every station has individual volume controls for the music and the intercom each one of these stations has built into it its own separate little amplifier. So if you have a system that consists of 12 remote stations, you have 12 amplifiers throughout your house, one in every station. And when you're adjusting the volume controls on the remote stations for the music and the intercom, you're adjusting the gain of the different inputs to the amplifier, and that's why you can adjust them separately. One of the byproducts of that type of design is even when these systems were brand new, and if you had one and it was newly installed, you would hear a certain amount of white noise from the speakers all the, all the time. White noise is this low but constant hissing sound that you hear from the speakers. And that white noise is generated in each station by its own little amplifier. These are fairly complicated, and one of the things that makes them doubly hard to work on is the way the main board is designed. So let's talk about the switchboard first because that's simple and then we'll talk about the main board. So here we have the back side of the main board and all we have are in here are circuit traces on solder connections. There's nothing really going on on here at all. When we turn it over to the front of the board we have a lot a lot of components or a lot of switches but nothing too terribly complicated. We have some LEDs here which are the indicator LEDs that show through the front of the speaker panel. We have a microphone here. There's a few little resistors. There's a diode there. Mostly what we have are all of these square little miniature tactile switches. And while these are fairly reliable, one of the things that we keep in mind here at the shop all the time, one of my mottos for the repair shop is, time changes everything. And when these stations were new, we very rarely would ever see a problem with a board like this, with the exception of outdoor patio stations where perhaps they got wet inside and the water would rust and corrode parts of the board or the switches sometimes. But barring the wet problem from being outside, inside stations very rarely had a problem. It's only really been in the last year perhaps, or maybe a little less than that, that we're starting to occasionally see these little tactile switches have a problem. Sometimes when you operate them, you can feel them. When you push them, they go, they go click, which I don't think you can hear. Hopefully you could hear that. You, you can push them, you feel them you feel them go click and you can hear it, but they don't always make a good connection. And occasionally you'd get one like that and you'd put a little switch cleaner on it and you'd work it back and forth a bunch of times and then wait overnight and usually it cleared itself up. 
but I've noticed recently that these switches are becoming somewhat more of a problem and we actually enough to the point that we've sourced exact replacements for these switches and sometimes we do actually have to replace some of them. You wouldn't necessarily replace all of them because like any design there's going to be certain ones that get used more than all of the rest and those are the ones that so far anyway it seems like have the most problems so you replace the ones that are really bad other than that every once in a while you'll get one with a microphone that fails but that's not that big of a deal this board isn't too hard to deal with but the main board is a whole different story so here's a close-up of the main board and you can see on the top side of the board is just really kind of what seems to be jam-packed full of stuff you've got a lot of integrated circuits there's these three there's this one there's some buried down here in the whole forest of capacitors there's another one here another one down here you've got these big audio isolation transformers here there's a few film capacitors and all that sort of stuff primarily what goes wrong on this side of the board has to do with the portion of the capacitor field or forest that has to do with the power supply. Like any piece of modern electronic equipment that's on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, sitting there waiting to be used, components like power supply capacitors slowly fail over time. And while this is a later version board, this one's dated as a, ver this is a version three dated as the 22nd week of July 2002, the earlier boards, the ones that were made in the early 90s, we're starting to see complaints from people where the, the amount of hiss or white noise in the stations is increasing and sometimes slowly turning into more of a hum than a hiss. And that tells me that it's probably a power supply failure. Every once in a while, you will get a station that won't communicate correctly. And oftentimes that has to do with several of the different ICs that are on the board. But it's really the other side of the board that makes working on these very challenging. So this type of board is what would be referred to as a hybrid board and a hybrid board means that it has different styles of components on it so on the top side of the board that we just looked at you have a lot of what are called through hole parts through hole parts are just like what they sound like you have components that have little wire leads on them i hope you can see the little wire leads right here and the wire leads go through holes that are in the board and it comes out the other side and then they're soldered in place. So those, the wire leads go through the hole, so it's through hole components. On this side of the board, we have entirely, well almost entirely, all what are mod, more modern surface mounted components. And what we're looking at here are, we have the screw terminals here where the wiring to the speaker would be terminated. So we have our black pair, our red pair, and our orange pair. Down here we have the little five dip switch package that allows us to move these switches and assign an identification number. Here we have the microcontroller that is programmed that allows the station to operate the way it does. And then what you're looking at here, all of these little shiny bits here and here and over here. These are all miniature surface mounted, primarily their resistors and capacitors. Okay, so this is as close of a zoom I, as I can do on this board. And I'm going to try to do this so you can see. So here are my tweezers, which is what you use when you work on surface mounted parts. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna point to this right here, this little yellow package right here. This is a little capacitor. And to show you, to illustrate to you how small that actually is, because it's always hard to relate to unless you have something to compare it to, I'm gonna sit right next to it, very carefully, right there. That's a grain of rice, right there. A standard old piece of rice out of an Uncle Ben's box, I think. It gives you some idea of how small these components actually are. And of course the rice wants to run away. So if we kind of line it up end for end, 
you can see that the capacitor is probably about one third the size of one grain of rice. And I can tell you from having done it for a long time, working on boards like this can be very challenging. It's a whole different skill set to replace components on a board like this because they are so incredibly small. You need smaller tools, smaller soldering irons. You need these, aren't, and these aren't the smallest chips that are, are parts that are made like this. If you were to open up your iPhone or your iPad, you would find chips that are smaller than this little capacitor. And sometimes they get so small that you actually have to have a microscope to be able to see them well enough to work on you need a lot of really good hand-eye coordination to do that. This is part of the challenge of working on a board like this is that it's so incredibly small that it's very difficult to work on. The other thing that's challenging about working on a board like this is this is a double-sided board so you can see all of these green, shiny green lines that go down here and like these lines this one goes up and ends and this one goes up and ends and they go and they keep going up and and there's a little silver dot at the end of each one those are vias that means the little dot is a little tunnel that goes through the board to the other side and there's something soldered onto the other side of it and the and the circuit path continues on the other side of the board so this is a double-sided through-hole board. You have connections to each pin on a lot of the components that are soldered on this side, but they're soldered through the board to paths on the other side. And since these are not NASA quality boards, repairing them can be very tricky because you know, you're working in a really tight area with a lot of parts and things in the way. And you have to be really, really careful when you desolder parts like this. Let's say for instance, I have to take this integrated circuit out. Well, there are 14 pins there are seven on each side, and they all go through holes in the board, and they're soldered from the other side of the board, but they're soldered, the legs are soldered to paths on this side and on paths on the other side, and you have to get all of the solder out of the holes as if it were enough that you could just take the board, turn it over, tap it on the table, and the part would fall out on its own, because if you don't get it desoldered thoroughly and you try to pry it out, you'll, you'll tear the copper foil that goes through the tunnels and you'll break the connection and then it's no good anymore. It's kind of a one-shot deal. You have to be really, really careful and it takes fairly expensive and sophisticated equipment to remove parts like this. Working on boards like this is time consuming, an interesting challenge, especially like right now, this board and that speaker that you saw in the beginning of the video is one of eight that a customer sent to me. They had a problem in their house, they had a flood, and a lot of things got damaged, and the intercom system stopped working, and they were able to determine with some help from us that they have a bunch of speakers that don't work all of a sudden. And so my job is to sit down, go through each one one at a time, repair them so they work again, because we can't find eight brand new speakers because they've been discontinued for so long. So that's some of the ins and outs of working on a station like a Newtone IS-515 or IS-519 from an IM-5006 or an IM-5000. Fortunately, here at the shop, Harvey is back. Harvey went to executive producer camp and he's been gone for about six weeks and he's back now to help out in the shop and he said it's time to make more videos again. He's got a lot of really new and innovative ideas. He's going to help me repair these boards because he's small and he's got really good eyesight he said and he said working on these won't be a problem for him so that should be kind of interesting. But the other thing Harvey would like you to do, oh Maybe you haven't met Harvey. Harvey's a hedgehog. He's our shop mascot and he's our executive producer of our YouTube videos. And he would really like you to subscribe now. That's what his little banner here says, subscribe now. I hope you found this interesting and helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. If you uh, follow Harvey's request and subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll get notifications when we post new videos. Our pace is about one a week, although Harvey says that's got to go up. So we'll see what happens. But that's all for today. See you on the next video.